Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 1. And what, what I'm doing this morning is starting in Luke in verse 26 right here. We are going to begin looking at the single most famous person next to Jesus Christ probably in history. In fact, uh, since the 12th century, when the Roman Catholic Church allowed people to name their children Mary, Mary has become the most universally naming uh, nomenclature for young ladies in the world, in history. In fact, in America, since they started Social Security Records, Mary is the most frequent named young lady in the world uh, among English-speaking and Social Security re uh, recipients. Mary is very popular. Why? How come there are 3.1 million women named Mary right now? Uh, there are 31 right in this congregation this morning. What is it that made Mary, as in the mother of Jesus, so famous? God's Spirit immortalize Mary's very common life. Did you know Mary is actually the Hebrew word Miriam, which is Moses' sister, which in the first century, one out of every five young ladies was named Miriam, Mary. One in five. So in the first century, Mary had a very common life. She was raised like everybody else, she had a name like almost all the other girls. She knew Mary's all around her. But how did God immortalize her life? It was the Spirit of God. And what we're going to look at, starting verse 26, and, and you can follow along. We're actually going to read this whole passage, all the verses about Mary. We're going to study what it means to walk through life in step with the Spirit of God. And there's nothing complicated about it. What Mary did is, is going to be possible and replicable in anybody's life because you don't need any gear and you don't need to go somewhere. It completely involves surrendering to the Spirit of God. And that's what we're studying. Uh, we're, we're looking systematically at the Holy Spirit's role. And there's nothing complicated about the life of a believer. It's just staying under the direction and control of the Holy Spirit. And if we do so, See, that's God's Spirit offers to us the most astounding life possible. Why? Because it's the life God planned just for us. God says, I've created you and designed you already for good works, that I have previously designed everything about you to accomplish. And when you realize that, it, it's living the best life possible the way the designer designed us, planned for us, and comes to move inside of us and empowers us to live. Well, God's Spirit is the one that prompts uncommon living. And, and that's what we're looking at this morning. How, how can we live this uncommon life in the midst of, of so many struggles? In fact, I, I was a um, corporate salesman for uh, American Home Products, and then it became Whitehall Labs, and then it became... Uh, Whitehall, Wyeth, I can't remember all the iterations of the name. I still have my first share of stock they gave when it split eight, I don't know how many times. I, it, it just was fun working for my one share of stock that is now many shares of stock. But I remember in the corporate world, I was just a youngster in the 80s, you know, a 20-year-old, flying all over and going to all these meetings. And I met the older ones, the 40 and 50-year-olds then. They were really old to me very young now, uh, but uh, they used to say to me, I'd sit at these sales meetings where everybody jetted in and there was unlimited almost expense accounts in the 80s, and when you talk to them personally, they'd say, my life just didn't turn out the way I expected. Uh, a lot of them compared their lives, do you remember when people used to actually buy and have rats living in their house? I mean, they chose to have, you know, little ones, but they would run in those little wheels, the, the little rat wheels, you know, that that it would just be running and the wheel would be spinning and it would be getting nowhere. And that's how you exercise the little rat in your house that you looked at through the glass. They said, that's how we feel in corporate America. Like, like we are giving it everything and, and we're wearing ourselves out and we're still where we were when we started. We're not getting anywhere. Well, God's Spirit can make any common life become uncommon. The Holy Spirit can make any ordinary life extraordinary. 
In other words, do you want to live an extraordinary life? God says, I offer it. I will give you what I designed you to be. The Holy Spirit can make a life headed nowhere into a life headed somewhere that's eternal. And each person in God's word that surrendered to the Spirit of God lived a life no one else lived or ever could have lived. I mean, think of them. I mean, Enoch. How many Enochs are there? How many people walk with God and God takes them to heaven and they don't ever die? But that was God's plan for Enoch. How many Moseses that know God face to face and they hang around God so long their face glows for days? That was God's plan for Moses. Now, just because we're not Enoch, we're not Moses, or we're not Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, doesn't mean that God doesn't have an extraordinary, unbelievably unique plan just for us. See, that's, that's what's so neat about knowing God. Today, we're going to look at a young lady. She had a very common name. In fact, she lived what I would call a common life. Mary lived a life that most people would consider to be deprived because she lived the average mundane life of first century agrarian occupied Israel. The Romans occupied them. They were heavily taxed. They were chafing at the taxation and the occupation. And Mary lived in this this little backwoods place, a very common life with most of every fifth person named her name, you know? One in five around her in Israel in century one had the common name. In fact, in the New Testament, uh, if you look closely, there are seven Marys, six others besides the one we're talking about this morning. Uh, There's Mary Magdalene, the woman that had the devils expelled from her. There's Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. There's Mary, the mother of James and John. There's Mary, the mother of Cleopas. There's Mary, the mother of John Mark, who gives refuge to Peter when he escapes from prison in Acts 12. And there's even Mary in the church of Rome in Romans 16. But none of those are the one we're talking about. You see, Mary stands out because she is connected to the birth of Christ. And that, oh, that Mary, the Mary, the one that everybody names their kids after. So what was it that made Mary's life stand out above all the other Marys of her day and since? There's only one thing. And and what it is is Mary is an example of the uncommon life the Holy Spirit brings. She is a, a prime example because there is nothing extraordinary about Mary until we look at what the Holy Spirit did through her. And by the way, everything the Holy Spirit did through her, he still is doing and wants to do today. Remember 2 Chronicles 16.9? The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for someone that God can show himself powerfully through. And that's what he's doing, and he found one in Mary. The Holy Spirit can make any common life to become uncommon The Holy Spirit can make any ordinary person to become extraordinary. Most scholars would agree that the Mary of the Bible, the mother of Jesus, was probably so much like all the other girls of her day. In fact, all the writers of scriptures that talk about her only give her 20 verses in the Bible. That's all we have, 20 verses about the most famous woman in history. And of them, 12 of them are right here before us in the book of Luke. So 60% of everything is going to be what we're covering this morning. And basically, from these scripture accounts, we conclude quite safely, number one, Mary was young. She was following the pattern of all the young ladies of her day that were betrothed, and she was probably 13, 14, or 15. At the high end, 15. That means she was getting older to get married. In fact, I was out in the lobby, and I was meeting people. I knew that they were in first service, and they said, this is our daughter that's 17. I said, why isn't she married by now? You know, and boy, they blanched, you know, because we, we don't live that way anymore, at least not unless you're down in Arkansas or somewhere where they uh, uh, used to. I remember I'm from Oklahoma. We, we used to have couples that would run across the border to get married barefoot in Arkansas as a 16-year-old, so... 
I mean, you can if you move south. She was also simple. That means Mary grew up in a sheltered, close, family-oriented atmosphere where she was so close with her family that everyone knew her and everything about her, and she really was never out of this kind of little orb of her clan. Very simple life. Agrarian, country, back roads, just nothing sophisticated. She was plain. In fact, there's no indication that Mary looks striking in any way. Now, hasn't that changed? In the 21st century, people have to be striking, I mean, to, to make the news. They have to be striking in their appearance. Mary, the most famous woman in history, was absolutely plain. You see, God's God's reckoning of what makes something important is so different than human thinking, especially 21st century thinking. Let's briefly meet this incredible woman. And so what we're going to do, starting in verse 26. It's uncommon, number one, that Mary listened to God's word. That's the first thing that's uncommon about her. And I'll read. You follow along in your Bibles. Luke 1, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary and having come in the angel said to her rejoice highly favored one the Lord is with you blessed are you among women and in verse 28 what we see is a message from God coming to Mary and what, what we notice is as soon as the angel starts talking uh, it, the angel said there in verse 28, as soon as the angels start talking, the Bible gives us this, this portrait of Mary listening to him. I mean, it, it's kind of simple if you think about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's God sending a message, Mary listening. It sounds simple enough, yet it's profound. Think about it. Mary listened to God. I mean, that's, that's a big thought. If you really think about the God of the universe, talking to one person, wow. Yet, every day we all have something in common with Mary, and with Enoch, and with Noah, and with Abraham, and David, and Job, and Paul. We can choose to listen to God speak. Did you know that God said, this is my word and this is how you know I'm talking. Now, there's a lot of people that will say, God told me to tell you something, or God told me to do this. And I can look at them and smile, and depending on who they are and how long I've known them, I can smile at them. But I can assure you, when they tell me that, I do not believe it's on this level. I do not know for sure, no matter how much they stand up and affirm, God told me this, I, I can't tell if he did or not. Most likely he didn't. But I do know that this is what God said. This is the once and for all settled in heaven word of God. And you know what is so interesting? Many of the people that claim God tells them to something don't even know the Bible well enough to know that God couldn't have told them that because he's already said in another place something exactly opposite of what they just told me he told them. And you know what they betray? They betray their ignorance of the God who has spoken. And so they should be cautious and check what he's already said before they represent and talk to them again. Well, he did talk to Mary. And each of the great cast of God's servants have one thing in common in the Bible. They each heard and responded to God in different ways. Some of them directly heard God's audible voice. Adam, walking through the garden with Eve, heard God actually talking. Enoch heard God's actual voice. Moses, he was so close to God, he started glowing and emanating. Such, such brightness, he had to veil his face because it scared people because he had been so close to God and knew God face to face. Other people heard God's voice relayed through the audible voice of a prophet. Do you remember when Nathan, we were just covering that last Sunday night, when Nathan came in and confronted David about his sin with Bathsheba, Nathan told David what God said. So through the audible voice of Nathan, David heard God. Other times, people hear the audible voice of God, and that's most frequent through God speaking. Do you know what uh, Daniel said in, in chapter 9 of his book? 
He said, we have not obeyed your voice, God, through your prophets, through the written word of God. In fact, in Daniel 9, he had just got done reading Jeremiah's book. And he was smitten with the disobedience he saw around him of God's people from what was written in the book. So there are many different ways. The book of Hebrews says God, who in diverse times and sundry ways in times past has revealed himself unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And this, Jesus came and affirmed all of the Old Testament and said the New Testament is coming through those that I have commissioned, and this is my word. And so Mary listened to God's word. And uncommon living means that we really listen. Have you ever had someone that isn't really listening? Uh, Bonnie and I recently went off somewhere. We were, I was speaking somewhere, and I asked those that were alive and remained at home to do two things. I said, take this and drive it a half a mile and put it in the big blue thing with wheels on it and put it there and wheel it out because it'll be stinky if you don't. And number two, Make sure that every day you take the little furry thing that's this big and wags and, and has bright, sparkling eyes. Take them outside because when you don't, they have this spot that's one of my favorite spots, and they leave these little dark things there. And I said, so just remember those two things. When I got home, the bags were still there. I didn't hear that. And the little brown things were there, too. Oh, we forgot. Did you know what? It's because no one was really listening that it was their job. Do you know what really listening means? Here, turn to John. You're in Luke. Go to the next book. Go to the right to John chapter 14, okay? You're in Luke. Turn over with me to John 14 because the common element of every servant of God's life is that they all listen to God speak. And if you really are listening to God, John 4, Jesus said this. This is, how, this is the test of knowing that you're really listening to God. So how do you know if you're really listening to God? Verse 21, Jesus said this, he who has my commandments. Now what that means is, like if you're holding right now the Bible, you have the revealed word of God. You have what God wants us to do. He who has my commandments, now look at this word, and keeps them. The word keeps is used outside of this verse in the New Testament to describe, for example, when Peter was kept by Herod in jail with four quaternions of soldiers, four squads of soldiers were guarding him around the clock. That's the word keeps. You know, you put him in the keep. You put him in the cell. You put him in the jail. You put him in the prison. You guard them. So if you have the word of God and guard that means you really listen to it and, and guard what the one who wrote it says. Look at this. That's, I know you're really listening if you love me enough to keep what I told you to do. See, the, the, the love-prompted obedience is the sign of really listening. Now look what happens. And see, this is, this is what is amazing. He who loves me will be loved. In other words, the ones who love or the ones who keep are the ones who, who listen and do what the one they love says. But if you love the Lord, you'll be loved by my Father. So if you love Jesus, you'll be loved by God, and I will love him. Now look at this word right there. I will manifest myself to him. I will reveal. Did you know that, that every time you and I come before the word of God because we love the God of the universe who revealed himself to us and we say, I want to know what this book says, not just because I want to know more academic stuff so that I can you know, win Bible trivia or I can impress people, but I want to know it because I want to guard what you've said because I love you. Do you know what that prompts? God says, I'm going to manifest. I'm going to reveal I'm going to show myself to you in a personal, powerful, life-transforming way. This is, Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open faces, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Every time we meet with God, 
because we love him and want to guard what he says, he reveals himself to us, and like Moses, we start reflecting him more. Well, that's what really listening to God is. Really listening to God means loving God. And if you love God, you're really listening. And if you're really listening, it shows that you love him. And we all need to examine whether we're giving to God what those who truly love him give. Either we hear God's word is just the word of, just like every other word, it's just on the same level as, you know, anything else we're listening to, or we say it's God. And I want to guard and, and keep that lodged in my mind, and I want to know what God has said because I love him, and I want to obey him. Well, that's number one. And you want to live an uncommon life in the spirit? Listen to the voice of God. That's what Mary did, and that's what all God's servants did. Number two, look at verse 29. Uh, the second thing about Mary is uh, it's uncommon that Mary chose to bow to God's grace. Do you know Mary sticks out in the first century because there's only a handful of people that it appears were really listening to God. All of them were religious. I mean, they were so religious, they were tithing everything and going to the temple and doing all their stuff. But most of them they weren't really listening. They were just going through motions. Jesus said that the multitude, the majority, were not really following him. The majority were not listening. What's the difference? Well, right here. But when she saw him, verse, look at verse 29. Now we're back to Luke. So back from John to Luke, chapter 1, verse 29. And when she, that's Mary, saw him, that's Gabriel the angel, she was troubled. That's an interesting word, troubled. It means falling apart. I mean, can you imagine standing in front of an angel? By the way, there are seven angels, it says in Revelation, that always face the throne of God. They're called seven pillars of fire because Hebrews 1 says that angels are flames of fire that are surrounding the throne. And so these seven pillars of fire, and we know two of them, Michael and Gabriel, they're always facing God, and they are these amazing, powerful angels. And one who is always facing God comes down and talks to a, this teenager, and she was troubled. I mean, I don't know whether he was glowing or what. It doesn't matter. The Bible, if, if it mattered, the Lord would have told us. But it scares her. She was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting it was. Verse 30, then the angel said to her, don't be afraid, for Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now, one of the neat things about the Bible is it was written in a very precise language. The New Testament was primarily written in the Greek language, and the Greek language is very precise. The Hebrew language is very picturesque. The Greek language is very precise. And literally, if you looked at the order of the words here, this literally means you have been discovered by the grace of God. The found favor with God means discovered. God's grace discovered you. In other words, you were found by grace. You know, the first time grace shows up in the Bible, do you know, remember where that is? That's in Genesis 6. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God is in the business of discovering people with his grace. And Mary was, was intercepted by God's grace, and her hearing and believing God's word led her to the open arms of Look at verse 47. Since you're in verse 30, look down 17 verses. What does she call God in verse 47? Isn't that interesting? We could clear up a lot of wrong theology if people would just read the Bible instead of putting their thoughts above the Bible. Mary says, God is my Savior. Mary needed a Savior, and God the Savior found her in her sin with his grace in verse 30, and she confessed from then on that God saved her and he was her Savior. How do you like that? Mary was not sinless. She was a sinner and was discovered like all of us who are saved have been by the grace of God, and she called God her Savior Mary joined the countless multitudes that will surround God's throne in heaven, singing that they are heirs of eternal life by God's grace. One hymn writer put it this way, Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our shame, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was shed. 
grace. You want to live an uncommon life in the Spirit? Bow to God's grace. Mary said, I don't deserve this. I, I don't understand why you want to do this to me. But I bow before you and receive your grace, and you're my Savior. You want to have an unusual life that's uncommon? Listen to God. And when you hear his voice, through his word, bow and submit and receive what he offers. And that leads to the third. It's uncommon. Look at verse 31. It's uncommon that Mary surrendered to do God's will for her life. Look what she heard. I mean, this was not, no wonder she was frightened and troubled and falling apart. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great. And he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Mary stood and heard that inside of her was going to be formed God, the son, that inside of her womb is going to be formed two little hands that she would feel, you know, all that kicking and pounding they do, you know, before they get too tight in there. Uh, that two hands that were going to be able to reach out and touch a person with leprosy and leprosy would flee from them. I mean, she really, that's astounding. That she was going to form within her a mouth that was going to be able to speak like no one ever spoke before. Now, she didn't know all those things, but she learned them. And that was God's will for her life. But not to lessen her calling at all, but think about it. Isn't that the opportunity every mother has? I'm not lessening the incarnation at all, but we saw last week that Jesus said, I didn't do any of this on my own. It was all the Holy Spirit's power that did all my ministry. He said, it, Luke said, Jesus confessed it was the Spirit of God that was doing all these miracles. And when you said what I'm doing is, is from the devil, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit because he's the one doing all this. Now think for a moment what I mean by that. For a mother to teach little ones that the greatest joy in all the world is to be touched by Jesus and be healed from the dreaded leprosy of sin and then to use their mouth to share the power of the gospel with all who listen, that is something we can all do and share in the same opportunity that Mary had. We can produce little followers of Jesus that can serve in his name and Jesus said those that come after are going to do even greater things than I did, which doesn't mean, you know, raise people from the dead and walk on water. It means that God is going to use them in, in an incredibly great way that is going to expand the kingdom. Now, Paul talks about this. As a mother, a mother can start the little feet of a child towards serving the Lord in so many ways. What an opportunity mothers share. That's why Paul said in 1 Timothy 2 that women are equal. They're saved from second-rate ministry to men in the church who teach and lead because the mothers bear and raise the teachers and leaders. Isn't that interesting? See, Mary said, I want to surrender to God's will for my life. And God designed me to bear a child that's going to serve the Lord. I can't do what he did, but I'm going to do what God called me to do. Now, just, you know, might as well put it in here. God has already said in this book that women are not pastors and elders. That's what God says. But Paul said when God said that, he didn't mean they're not equal. Galatians 3.28 says there is no difference between men and women. We all have equal spiritual giftedness and access. We just have different callings and roles and gender-specific ministry that God has ordained for us within his church. But not second and first. Equal, but different. And that's what Mary found. And if you want to live an uncommon life in the Spirit, surrender to God's will. Number four... It's uncommon that Mary became 
the dwelling place of God. I, I love reading this. Look at what verse 34 says. And Mary said to the angel, how, how is this going to happen? I, how can I have a child? I don't even know a man. She says, my mother told me enough that I know I can't have a child because I am not married to Joseph, and I can't. Okay? And the angel answered and said to her, verse 35, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and the power of the highest is going to overshadow you. This almost speaks about Mary just being surrounded. It's almost like the glory cloud of the Lord that used to surround the tabernacle. God is going to come and surround you, Mary. Now keep reading. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now notice Mary's response. After, uh, even after being sought out and given such an amazing message, humble Mary has no pride. She, she said, how can this be? And he said, look, look at the end of verse 37, for with God nothing will be impossible. She said, I don't see how, how this is possible. He said, with God nothing is impossible. Mary knew in her heart that she was nothing, she was not worthy to be so greatly blessed, but when the power of the highest overshadowed her, when Mary was surrounded by the Shekinah of God, then God the Son entered her womb. And I wonder if there was a glow. I mean, you know, people think about that. They think, oh, wasn't it amazing to be Mary? Just think about all of a sudden this, this big cloud of glory surrounded her and God was all around her and all of a sudden, poof, God was within her. And people think, oh, that must have been really amazing that Mary experienced God within, and all of a sudden her body became God's temple. That's what happened. Mary's body became the temple of God, and God, the Son, Jesus Christ, came to live within her. Now think about that for a minute. Was Mary then the very first New Testament believer indwelt by Christ? You know, we read about that all the time. Indwelt by Christ. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. Was she the first one? But that's what all of us believers have the joy of being now. We're the dwelling. I mean, if, 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 if we have eternal life, if we are partakers of Christ this morning, we have Christ living within us. Have you ever thought about that? You know, we go, oh, Mary had Christ. So do we. That's astounding. Though Christ was physically within her, he was also spiritually within her, just as he dwells in our hearts by faith, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 3.17. God was doing the impossible in her life, and God is doing the impossible in our life. And if you want to live the most uncommon life, live as God's dwelling place. Live as the very dwelling place of God. Can you imagine after this how Mary carried herself? God was living within her. Have you ever thought about how we should carry ourselves? God is living in you. If you have, like Mary, said, I need a Savior and I'm not worthy, and I want you, God, to save me. You become the dwelling place of God. But that's not all. Real quickly, number five, look at verse 38. It's uncommon that Mary served God's plans. Look at her response to all this that God wanted in verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary said, gave her yes to God. That's what you want. That's what I want. Mary declared she was a slave of God. When you read Luke 138, you see the self-description Mary gives. I am the Lord's servant. Wow, what a submissive and godly attitude. You want to live an uncommon life? Say yes to God's plans. Even if you don't understand them, even if they sound impossible, even if you just can't think he'd ever want to do that with you, just say yes. That's all Mary did. Number six, here's something else. Look what pops out of Mary's mouth. It shows that something was going on inside of her in verse 46. And then Mary said, 
My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoiced in God, my Savior. This is her testimony of her salvation. And if you read all the way down through verse 55, which we won't this morning because we do have communion this morning, in those 10 verses, Mary quotes 20 different passages of Scripture. 20. In 10 verses, quotes pieces. You know, what it, you know what, it's like she blended together these 20 verses and all of it came out like one beautiful tapestry. That, and, and I love the, the proportion. She mentions the Lord 19 times and herself only four times. You know what that means? That Mary fed her soul from the Word of God. She nourished. She, she had God's Word within. And you know what? It's uncommon that, that Mary was so much in tune with God. It, just for a moment, think about how hard it was. Did you know every drop of water in Mary's life, she had to go in a clay pot, walk to a well or a cistern, lower it down, get it up, and bring it home. Every drop that's used in the home. Every bit of grain that was used to make the bread. She did not go, you know, down to Costco and get the, you know, the fresh out of the oven. She had to grind that herself in a stone mill and bake it in an oven that had to be constantly fed wood. And when the meal was over, she had to go back and get more water to wash the dishes. And yet, in that immensely taxing schedule that a woman had in the first century and still has in the 21st, Mary found time to nourish her soul in the Word of God. And then, look at chapter 2, verse 19. It's uncommon that Mary finally stayed sensitive to God. Look what it says in 2.19. This is the ending of the account about insight into her. It says, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. You know what? Mary, it wasn't like a hit and run and, yep, okay, I'll do that, and that's over, and I'm going to get on with life. Mary treasured. You know what that means? That's what flowed out of her in that, my soul magnifies the Lord. Mary was so full of wanting to know more about God through his word that it, it came out of her life, and she treasured it within. So, here's the last point. You want to live an uncommon life this morning? Are 3.1 million other people named the same thing as you? Kind of like common, like Mary? There are 3.1 million Americans named Mary. You want to live an uncommon life? By the Holy Spirit, choose to listen to God's word. Don't just read it. Say, God, this is your word, and I want to really listen to it, and I want to keep what you say because I love you. Not because I'm earning my way to heaven, not because I'm going to, you know, gain. I just love you. And I want you to reveal yourself to me. And you've told me you only reveal yourself to me if I will guard what you say and do it because I love it. Not because I'm afraid, not because I have to. Because I love you. And bow to God's grace and say, it's not about me. I can't do it. It's you, it's your word, it's your grace, it's your power. I want to surrender to what your will is for God. I want your will for my life. Surrender to God's will, what he wants. Live like you're the dwelling place of God. Boy, that should change how a lot of us behave. In fact, it should change how all of us behave. Can you imagine how Mary walked around delicately at the beginning thinking about God with me all the time? God's with us all the time if you're saved. Live like the dwelling place of God. Go through life serving God's plans. Feed your soul God's word so it's just filling you and, and it just magnifies him. And don't quit. Stay sensitive to God. So this morning, it's time for communion. So what we're going to do, let's all bow our heads and prepare for communion. With your head bowed as the men go out to, to celebrate uh, or to bring in the elements for us to celebrate. With your head bowed, think about this. Mary, listen to God's word. Do you want to this morning say, Lord, I want to, I want to hear your voice and your word. Mary chose to bow to God's grace. Have you ever bowed to God's grace? Are you saved this morning? Communion is only for those who are born again. 
Mary surrendered to do God's will for her life. Have you ever surrendered what God's plans are for your life, not everybody else's, just yours? Mary became God's dwelling place. Are you? Mary served God's plans. Do you know that that's what you want more than anything else? Mary fed her soul God's word. And Mary stayed sensitive to God. Father in heaven, I thank you this morning that this can be the beginning of the greatest Christmas of our lives. If we will, like your common, ordinary, plain, young servant named Mary, if we'll just listen to you and respond bowing to your grace. And you can begin in the work in us that you will bring to completion and we will fulfill the plan that you designed us to fulfill of good works that magnify and point toward you. And at this communion, we just want to we wanna renew and give our yes to you. And I pray that at this most sacred gathering of your body, when we actually hold the pictures of your body and blood, and the one where you say that we should really examine ourselves before we have anything to do partaking of this, that we would do that so that we, as we partake, can be saying, this is just a reminder that I am your temple. I am your slave. I want to do your will. Thank you for this bread, a picture of your body that was given for us. Bless us as we worship you through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the men are going to come and pass the bread to us, and we're going to sing about how Jesus accomplished this. It's because he paid the price, and everything's paid for. Jesus paid it all. Let's sing to him this morning. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Now this next stanza, I'm going to ask you ladies to sing the stanza, because this is Mary's testimony. Mary said, there's nothing good. I'm nothing. Why are you doing this? And the Lord said, it's my grace that's discovered you. So ladies are going to sing that, and then men, uh, we're going to join in on the chorus, and, and after Nancy makes sure we're on the right note, she's going to pull off and we're just going to sing with our voices, our testimony. If you're partaking of communion this morning, then this is your testimony. Jesus paid the price for every one of my sins. He became my sins, and I am only coming to him because he has already been treated by God like he did everything I did, and I have received his perfect righteousness. Jesus paid it all. So ladies sing. And then all of us are going to sing with just our voices the chorus. Here we go, ladies. For Jesus paid it all, all. To him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And the way he
he did that was in his own body, on the tree, God made him to be sin for us. And communion is our reminder every time that Jesus bore my sin and I have received him as my only hope of salvation. Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this remembering me. Let's partake together. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you that this communion that we partake of was accomplished at the cross. That you, Lord Jesus, hung there between earth and heaven as your Father poured out his wrath upon you and turned his back upon you as you hung in the darkness and you experienced the horror of our eternal separation from God that we deserved. I thank you this morning that you shed your blood so that in you we might have redemption, even the forgiveness of our sins. And the eternal hope that you're never going to make us answer for even one of them. Thank you for the blessing, as Paul called it, the cup of blessing we partake of. I pray that as we remember what you did and sing these words to you, it will be a precious gift we give you this Christmas season because we love you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. As a man passed the cup to us, let's sing about the cross of Jesus Christ. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Now, ladies got to sing. Now it's the men's turn. Let's sing this stanza, ladies, you join us at the chorus. Here we go, men. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. This is our last stanza we're going to sing. Uh, let's just read the Well Might the Sun in Darkness Hide, and then we will sing that chorus before we partake. Let's just read those words. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ, the mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. Let's all stand together and don't spill your cup and let's sing as our testimony of what Christ did. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I receive my sight, and now I am happy all the day. And why we're happy is what Paul said, we know that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. If Christ lives in us, he's our hope of glory. And I will never have to answer for all of my lifetime of sins, but I will forever look upon him who bears the scars of being crushed for my iniquities, and I will forever be offering thanks to him, because I don't understand why he did it, but I am trusting completely in his sacrifice. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant that's in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it, remembering me. Let's partake together. 
And Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege of worshiping you as your body this morning. I pray if there's just one person here this morning who knows down deep they're not your temple. They know in their heart that you have never moved in. They know that their sins are still on them because they feel the coldness of their heart of darkness. I pray that this morning that your spirit, as everyone else goes the other direction, that you will draw them to yourself and either right where they're standing right now, they will cry out and say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I'm the sinner you died for. Be merciful to me. Or if they need someone to actually open your word and show them the plan of salvation, while everybody is leaving, I pray they'd come to one of our godly Titus II women, one of our elders standing here at the front at the end of every service, and let them help them seal the greatest moment of their life when they become your dwelling place. Oh, Lord, I pray no one would leave without knowing that they are walking out of here as the very dwelling place of you, O oh God, and living that way because we love you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.